Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Joseph Arrington, a professor of anthropology and international and area studies at Yale University. Professor Arrington is interested in the linguistic dimensions of social life, ranging from the social implications of patterns of verbal communication to forms and uses of sociolinguistic hierarchies to the linguistic effects of large-scale dynamics. His research and writing have focused on linguistic dimensions of modernization and identity in Java and Indonesia, reflecting his broader interests in semiotics and the politics of language. Today we talk with Professor Arrington about his book, Linguistics in a Colonial World, a story of language, meaning, and power. Welcome, Professor Arrington. Thank you very much. Let's begin with an overview of your book. Tell us about it. Well, it's a book that I wrote to try and address a kind of gap in the literature in colonial studies or post-colonial studies. Uh, in the last 30 years or so, a great deal of literature, especially in the humanities and history, about uh, the colonial period from a mm -hmm. critical point of view. Uh, a few articles have been written about linguistics as part of the colonial project, but no one had tried to do an overview, which is what the book is supposed to be. It a actually, it has a, a more practical reason for being, which is that I was asked to do a review article for the annual review of anthropology on the topic, so I did that, and an editor for a book series saw it and asked me if I would turned it into a book and thinking it would be much easier than it was, I agreed. Okay. So. Let's talk about the term linguistics. Define it for us. That's a, th there have to be several answers to that question. Mm -hmm. uh, in this, at this time, linguistics is the study of language structures, but always trying to find out about neurocognitive endowments. Mm -hmm. of humans, what it is that makes members of the human species different from all others because of their capacity to acquire and use uh, human languages, which are distinct from all other forms of communica communicative behavior we know about. Mm -hmm. uh, but in an earlier era, and the one that this book is about, uh, a simpler answer was that people who did linguistics were working to reduce speech to writing. Okay. That was figure out how to take what they heard coming out of mouths and present it with an orthography on paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the work I was doing, that word reduce really has two meanings because on one hand, to reduce speech to writing is to get its essence. You know, get, reduce it to its essence and put that on paper, which many of them did quite successfully, but they were also reducing it in that they were getting rid of things that they judged not to be important. Mm -hmm. but what they were getting rid of was, in fact, for the speakers of these languages in colonial situations, really quite important and had meanings in their lives that was made to go away okay. in this work. And what do you mean by the term colonial linguistics? Most basically, the work that was done, this reducing of speech to writing in situations of colonial encounter, where at first Europeans and later Americans went far from home with mm -hmm. projects of various kinds involving speakers of radically different languages and members of radically different cultures. Okay. And how did you do the research for the book? Well, for this, the research was mostly in the secondary literature uh, because it covers four centuries, uh, four continents, uh, and I only know about a little bit of that. Okay. Uh, from my own research. So I relied a great deal on secondary literature, some of my colleagues who have written in this general topic about spe specific times and places uh, were quite helpful in this regard. But it was, I was heavily reliant, especially on literature by historians and historians of linguistics. Okay. How does colonial linguistics influence contemporary language and cultural differences? Can you give us some examples? Sure. Uh, suppose I give you two examples, okay. one where colonial linguists created a situation where they divided people and another where they, they united them. Oh, perfect. So uh, although I didn't use this example in the book, but uh, if you look at South Africa now, you find they have 11 national languages. Okay. And if you ignore Afrikaans and English, which are European derived, there are nine native African languages. Now five of those. Uh, 
are officially distinct languages, but if you listen to them and you look even at the way they're written, you can see that they are very similar. They are similar enough that you could call them dialects of the same language, mm -hmm. except that when missionary linguists, they were most of the linguists doing this work, came to those regions of what is now South Africa, they divided up the territory, so the French had some territory, the British had others, the German had others. And missionary linguists in each of those areas did their own work, came up with their own ways of writing these languages, used that to teach literacy, used it to convert people to Christianity. And when independence came, the people who spoke those languages, as far as they were concerned, these were distinct languages. Mm -hmm. And so they continue to be to this day. Even when uh, South Africans, linguists and politicians themselves say that we can, as they say, harmonize these languages into one, but that is resisted because these are now regarded as distinct languages. Mm -hmm. So that's a legacy of divisions between the missionary linguists who did this work. So there's an example of division. Right. Uh, if you look at the country, a country like Indonesia, which is the one I know most about, these days if you go there you will find that of a population of 270 million, 220 million of them speak Indonesian, the national language. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1910 you would have heard perhaps two, 2 million people, perhaps 2% of the population speaking a language that now counts as Indonesian. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is that the uh, Dutch imperial government decided it needed a language of administration, it didn't want to use Dutch, so it sent linguists out to create a standard form of the Malay language, and they started using that in their offices, they started teaching it in their schools, and that language was then taken over, sort of it was pirated by the first nationalists, and they said, this is no longer the Dutch Malay, this is now Indonesian, the national language. And uh, long story short, starting in a, the mid-60s, that language was taught all around a territory as big as the United States mm -hmm. as the national language. So that now, lo and behold, it is spoken from one end of the country to the other. But what's being spoken and what's being learned has its origins in the work of those uh, linguists in the uh, early 20th century. And so there's wh an what's example the time period? How long did that take before that happened? Well, independence was the, the language's name was sort of changed in 1928 by the proto-nationalists. Mm -hmm. Independence came in 1945, but it was really not until the late 1960s that a school system was built by the government, by the central government top down, mm -hmm. everywhere on Indonesian territory. And in those schools, that that's where young people learned how to read and write, and what they were learning to read and write was Indonesian. Mm -hmm, okay. So by 1990 or so, perhaps 60% of the population said they spoke Indonesian, and now it's closer to 90, 95%. Okay, here's a question for you. Do you need to speak the language you're studying if you're a linguist? That also depends on the kind of linguistics you do. Okay. If you're doing linguistics of the kind that I first mentioned and you're interested in universal properties, not so much. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're interested in language as it plays out in people's lives the way I am, yes, you do. Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, it is the, the goal and the constant frustration because I will never speak any language in Indonesia the way they do. Every five-year-old speaks the language better than I do, but it doesn't stop me from trying. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Um, in writing the book, was there anything in particular that really surprised you or doing the research? Yeah, the thing that surprised me the most was how the cases I was looking at from the colonial era are relevant for looking at what is happening now in an era of language death and language endangerment. Mm -hmm. I mean, th the condition of the world now is one in which languages are, are, are passing out of use right. by the scores. Um, there might be 6,000 languages spoken now in 40 years. There might be 2,000. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's, it's like biodiversity. <laughs> Linguistic diversity is going. But in any case, linguists who are working now to try and save languages, keep mm -hmm. them from dying, sometimes find themselves in situations that are curiously like those of their colonial era predecessors mm -hmm. in terms of the effects of the decisions they make about how they're going to write languages down. So, okay. so there are ways in which, I mean, the last chapter of the book is really addressed to them, just saying, if you look at your predecessors, 
maybe you can take some lessons from uh, inadvertent consequences of their work. Mm -hmm. That was the thing that surprised right, me most. Right. So you mentioned these languages are dying off. Is it because literally the people who speak them are dying off? Sometimes. I mean, yeah, and, and then should we, con should we be concerned that these languages are disappearing forever? Uh, my answer, you, uh, it won't yes, surprise you, my answer, answer, yeah. is, my answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, some languages are dying because the people are dying. Uh, I mean, that's happened for many years. I mean, genocide kills languages and not just groups. Right. But many more languages are dying because of, let's call it globalization. So in a language like Indonesian, for instance, will probably be responsible for the death of 250, 300 languages in the next two generations. Wow. And that's happening. It's not that anybody's forcing people not to speak the local ethnic language. It's that kids, you know, they, they see where the opportunities that they want are. They want to move perhaps to the city. They want a job uh, that earns money rather than working on a farm. Mm -hmm. That requires Indonesian. Uh, in some cases, parents will actually require their children to speak Indonesian, or it could be Spanish in Latin America or Russian in uh, the former Soviet Empire. Uh, the large national languages are the ones that are sort of taking over. So there's no, it's hard to point at people in saying that they are engaging in coercion. Uh, but there are times when you have to wonder if people are really, if they have a choice in the matter. Right, I see. Uh, and, and those are the situations that a linguist or a linguist like me in any case is concerned about. If people don't know that there's a chance that they could save their language, well then they don't have that option. If, if a linguist can come and say, here's, we can show you how to write your language or we can help you uh, document it on videotape. Mm -hmm. and if you offer that option to people and they want to make use of it, well that's a good thing. Sure. So the strategy would be not to tell people to save their languages, but to show them how to do it if they want. Okay, very good. And conclusions in your book? Well, in some ways I suppose that was the conclusion okay. that it's, it's a mistake to look back 80 or 100 years and think we're different from that now and we know more and we don't make those mistakes. Um, that we have habits of thought when it comes to language. Uh, and we have a, we very easily mistake the differences between what it is to speak a language and to read and write it. And we're always making those mistakes and they're always bringing about consequences that we should at least recognize whether or not we want them to happen. So that's a, it's a very simple conclusion, but it is kind of broad mm -hmm. in its effects. Okay, very good. Thank you so much for being here today with us and sharing some of your work. Thank you, it was my pleasure. For more information about Professor Arrington and his research, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.